בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, we are back here on our Wednesday night. סתם את הרביי, where uh, after a few דברי תורה, בעזרת השם, uh, give uh, each other some חיזוקים. After that you guys will ask some questions, and בעזרת השם הקדוש ברוך הוא will give us the answers. Tonight's show is for the רפואה שלמה, for uh, רבנו הרב אפרים כחלון, and בן uh, שולמית, הרבנית uh, לבנה בת שרה. הרבנית שרה בת ענת, אבי מורי דוד בן אסריה, אמי מורתי דוריס בת ז'ורה, uh, and also for the הצלחה רבה for מרשה בת ג'ולי, איילה בת מרשה, סמיאל בן מרשה, ספס בן מרשה, אלכזנדר בן מרשה, לואיס בן מרשה, and all of עם ישראל and all the righteous Noahais that continue to contribute and support us and all the amazing things that uh, we're doing. For uh, everyone that uh, saw the new poster uh, of the event, Baruch Hashem, the poster, uh, aside from uh, looking beautiful, the uh, outcome of, uh, <laughs> of what will be from that poster is even better. Uh, seeing all these, literally, G'dolei uh, Adol, one after another, are going to be joining us at this monumental event in Eretz Yisrael on August 4th. We, um, we had started a uh, campaign for anyone that uh, wants to contribute Uh, to uh, be a partner in this uh, huge event. We're expecting uh, around 1,500 people. Of course, all of you are invited to come, regardless of whether you live in Israel or somewhere else. I highly recommend coming. It's definitely going to be an event of a lifetime. Uh, we're expecting a lot of people, a lot of chizukim. There's uh, going to be uh, you know, uh, some amazing things there. We're sparing no, uh, no expense, uh, and we're uh, looking into doing things uh, very, very... Uh, Uh, you know, to the highest possible level we can for the sake of the honor of the Torah. Uh, there's not going to be any uh, money collecting at the event. Anyone that comes, comes for free. You're even going to get some food and you'll get some other things at the event. Uh, and for anyone that wants to contribute and be a partner of all the Kedusha that will be uh, uh, at this event, you're welcome to donate at bhdonate.org. B is in Be'ezrat, H is in Hashem, uh, donate. at, uh, um, sorry, .org, and anyone that wants to support the USBs uh, and also enter the raffle, uh, which uh, will be uh, announced next week at the event here in Florida on uh, the 27th of July. Uh, we're having an event here at the Hilton, uh, and uh, you'll see uh, the, the winner of the raffle, of whoever sponsored the, uh, you know, the tickets, the, um, the USBs. will be announced at the event. You go to tikunabrit.live, tikunabrit.live, and you'll be able to get uh, a raffle. Just a few moments ago, somebody else bought into it. There was one person that recently bought uh, 10 of them. Uh, so uh, certainly a few people are taking advantage of the opportunity, even if they're not uh, uh, necessarily buying it to, uh, to win a ticket to Israel. They could buy themselves a ticket for Israel, but they realize uh, what opportunity we have with these uh, USBs. Also at... Um, Uh, at some point later today, will I uh, announce uh, a, a special uh, treat for all of you that are uh, watching this show right now uh, in regards to the USBs, but Hashem, I'll try to remember. So, uh, aside from that, we have a, uh, a lot of wonderful things uh, coming up, you know, with these events and everything else. As far as Shulim, the next show we're going to have is actually the event next week. There's not going to be a show on Sunday night uh, or on Tuesday. Uh, the next year is going to be the event next Wednesday. Uh, and then after that, I'm not sure what the schedule is going to be while I'm in Israel, but uh, you have, Baruch Hashem, a few thousand uh, videos online that uh, I'm sure uh, need to be reviewed. <clears throat> so with that being said, we have ourselves Parashat Pinchas. Parashat Pinchas Uh, there's really no end to the amount of Torah that you can learn from Parashat Milchas, whether it's, uh, you know, the mitzvah of being zealous, zealous for Hashem, and really uh, zealous for the right reason versus the wrong reason, uh, because we learned that uh, Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron HaKohen, uh, he uh, did something that was uh, exceptional, because if Hashem had to check his heart to see if what he was doing was really for the sake of Hashem or for the sake of his anger, for the sake of uh, something else, for the sake of his ego. 
because had he killed Zimri and Cosby uh, purely out of frustration or, uh, or jealousy or any other reason other than for the sake of the honor of Hashem, then it would have actually been considered murder. That's a sin. So, uh, but, uh, and that's actually what some of the people, uh, you know, from the Shimon tribe and the rest of Klal Israel uh, thought when they, uh, after he killed them, they started, uh, uh, you know, really going after him. And some even thought to kill Pinchas. Uh, but uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu made sure that uh, everyone knew that uh, Pinchas ben Azar ben Aaron Cohen eshivet chamati me'al bnei Yisrael bekinato et kinati. That uh, Pinchas ben Azar ben Aaron Cohen he turned back the, the wrath of Kadosh Baruch Hu that was upon Am Yisrael when he zealously avenged Hashem's vengeance. So uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu did not count this as a sinful murder, but rather the exact polar opposite where this was the greatest mitzvah that anyone could ever do because at that moment the uh, the right to exist was taken away from Am Yisrael Chas Shalom but that's actually what happened they made Hashem angry enough uh, with their idolatry and immorality that uh, they literally lost their right to exist and if it wasn't for the act of Pinchas we wouldn't be here uh, and quite frankly, neither would the world. So Pinchas literally saved the world, and therefore he received a special gift from Hakadosh Baruch Hu that's called Briti Shalom. He got the uh, the covenant of peace. Now, as we said yesterday in the Shiul, peace Shalom is also another name for the Shechina. Uh, so the Shechina was constantly settling over the uh, you know over the uh, uh, Pinchas. Uh, just imagine having the Shechina among you at all time. Uh, it's literally uh, one of those things that uh, a person can't even imagine, even at their greatest dream that they ever had. Pinchas also became a Kohen Gadol. Uh, and uh, when he actually, uh, later on in the Torah, when they go to battle uh, against uh, Midian, it's at the same time that uh, Bil'am Rasha also comes to collect his money from Balak for his winning strategy of causing Am Yisrael to sin and therefore 24,000 of them to die. And Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Cohen is tasked with the, uh, the, the very important task of killing Bil'am. Now Bil'am wasn't a regular person. Bil'am was uh, able to uh, use all types of uh, 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 mystical powers, uh, some say from the, the powers of impurity, some say otherwise, but nonetheless, when uh, Bil'am saw that Am Yisrael is coming to attack the Midianites, he tried to fly away. And uh, Pinchas, that was a Kohen Gadol now, that had the tzitz on his head, used the name of Akadosh Baruch Hu, the Midrash says, and uh, f- flew right after him and killed him in midair. Literally, like some of the Hollywood films uh, tried to depict, was uh, things that simply exist in the Torah. Now, when we talk about this Briti Shalom, the Shechina, that's called Shalom, being upon uh, uh, Pinchas, you know, the average person out there has no concept of what having the Shechina is, but if you tell them, would you like a peaceful life? There's really not a person on earth that would say no. Uh, even people that like action, even the people that like to go up and down with, uh, you know, with, with different things, uh, you know, definitely want to have some more peace. Everyone wants to have some peace. This is also one of the reasons why anytime somebody goes on vacation, usually the, the most memorable part of every vacation is when you eventually arrived home. Uh, the most memorable part of uh, people's days, or at least the part that they look forward to, uh, each day is to go home. Everybody, uh, you know, usually connects home with peace. And everybody wants to have a peace of mind. And if they have a lot of stress, they uh, yearn for having a peaceful life. So, of course, we would all like to have this Briti Shalom. Now, the Torah continues and says uh, that after this uh, whole story with Pinchas, we are going into another census. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tasks Moshe Rabbeinu to uh, do another census because now that there's been... A, uh, a lot of time have passed since the Miraglim, since the, uh, the spies. Many people have died over those generations uh, since the last census. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells uh, Moshe Rabbeinu to do another census to see how many people we still have despite uh, the death, despite the time elapsing, despite 
all of the different things that they've endured and each tribe is named uh, not just from their uh, current uh, uh, leaders but also from people that uh, from the past and there's a few things that stand out there's a few names that stand out that uh, we've heard before earlier parts of the Torah where uh, the first one that we see that stands out is uh, in the um, in the tribe of Levi you have Korach uh, Korach ve'adato, you have uh, Korach that uh, he, uh, and his uh, followers all died and all still in Genom today. But uh, one of the things that Torah says, Ubne Korach lo metu, that the sons of Korach did not die. Now, it's interesting that Torah mentions that, yes, there are all of these people that are alive. Korach died, but his sons didn't die. Now, we want to see really what's you know i mean there's a lot of names here there's a lot of people here and there's a lot of people that didn't die why are they mentioned why are the sons of korach mentioned that and their symbolic uh uh you know a statement is that they didn't die further we see that uh, later on when they talk about the tribe of yehuda it says bnei yehuda er ve'onan v'yamat er ve'onan be'eretz knan that uh, in the tribe of Yehuda, they already go back hundreds and hundreds of years to the time of Yehuda, the original Yehuda, the son of Yaakov, uh, who had several sons, and his uh, Er Onan uh, were the first two sons that were mentioned, and it says Er and Onan, Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan. Now, they didn't just die a week ago, or, or a year ago, or even 50 years ago, or even in Egypt. They died before Yaakov ever went to Egypt, but yet they're mentioned here that they did die. Now, a lot of people died in those hundreds of years. You don't have all of those names mentioned. And it's interesting that the Torah mentions that the Eren Onan did die, whereas the sons of Korach did not die. Now, one of the things we saw with Siyat Dishmaya in the past is that there is a connection between this Briti Shalom, this, uh, this peace, that a person has versus a, that that uh, that Pinchas is being gifted with uh, to these two uh, exceptional uh, statements made about people that uh, uh, you know that we heard about in the past, but uh, we thought that the story about them was over. We're, uh, we're we're reminded that the sons of Korach didn't die, and we're reminded that the sons of Yehuda did die. And one of the main significant differences between the two is that when it comes to uh, the acts of each one of them, they both started with sins. The, uh, the sons of Korach chased their father's advice, chased the honor, chased kavod, chased money, chased everything that unfortunately many people till this day are chasing. And Korach and anyone that followed him went to Gehenom, but yet the sons of Korach abandoned their father's false beliefs abandoned their father's desire for leadership and honor and did tshuva in the last minute and the torah has a special place for them to remind us that because they did tshuva because they repented and abandoned their bad ways before it was too late they did not die not only they didn't die back then but they lived for eternity Till this day, they're in Olam Abba, they're in Gan Eden, whereas their father and anyone else that followed him is in Genom. On the other hand, Er Onan, Er Onan, that uh, the Midrash tells us were only uh, young, eight-year-old uh, pe- uh, kids. I mean, technically to us, they're kids, but in those days, of course, people age differently, as we see from the story of Rivka and some of the other people that are mentioned in the Torah, where uh, they're, uh, they're, they aged very, very differently, grew up very differently, but nonetheless when they made the sin of wasting seed akadosh Bahu simply decided to kill them apparently even before matan torah there was a uh, logical law uh, in creation that akadosh Bahu instituted into the world that wasting seed is in essence antithetical to this life antithetical to existence and evil in the eyes of hashem and therefore eren onan who did not do tshuva they ended up dying and not their death is not just during their time their death is mentioned again in the torah in essence we see that the the sons of korach that seem to have had a more difficult test 
a test of money a test of honor a test of anything that you could possibly desire they did tshuva and because of that they had the in essence that peace that peace that exists till this day the peace that pinchas earned through zealousness the peace that all of us wish we had whereas Eren Onan who did not do tshuva uh did uh simply lost lost everything now one of the things that when you talk to people uh is that everybody has similar anxieties and today uh, you know it's, it's there's a unique type of anxiety that has uh has become much more popular especially in the last couple of years with all of the things that are happening with coronavirus and the uh you know omnicron and all the other nonsense that's uh that's in the air whether it's the monkey disease from the homosexuals or it's the political disease that every country has everybody is is concerned about some new world order or some hidden scheme behind uh, something that the government is pushing or society is pushing or big pharma is pushing and you talk to people and you see literally how miserable their life is because they don't have a moment of peace they're constantly looking over their shoulder of who's about to get them who's about to attack them who is trying to fool them who is taking advantage of them and it's rare to see anybody having a moment of peace now if you look at the pictures they have on the internet and the world wide web altogether uh with social media and so on it looks like everybody has a peaceful life they're hanging out on the beach they're hanging out in some fancy car they're hanging out at some casino at some party everybody looks like they have peace and they have a good time and they even have uh, you know statements where they say that they're having a good time but when people like myself talk to them and then they start you know crying to you even though they only met you 37 seconds ago about the misery that they call life and how they're worried that uh, they're going to be alone forever or they're worried that they're going to be stuck in this relationship forever or they're worried that they won't have money to eat or they're worried that people are stealing the money that they have because they found that they have a lot of money or they're worried that uh, big pharma is trying to kill them or they're worried that big pharma doesn't have a cure for them or they're worried about the government or they're worried about some other thing everyone is constantly worried and you literally see how people are clueless when it comes to solving their problem because instead of answering that worry with with something that could actually help it what do they do they feed themselves more information that makes them even more worried they're worried that perhaps the government is trying to kill off eight billion people or six billion because of course they have to leave somebody to pay taxes uh they're worried that the big pharmaceutical companies are trying to kill all of its patients they're worried that uh this uh you know the diseases out there are real or they're not real and instead of actually solving the problem of their anxiety the reason behind their anxiety which we'll get to in a second what do they do they spend an exorbitant amount of time learning more about what they're worried about as if it's going to do anything as if you becoming an expert about the virus or the or the antivirus or the norton and the McAfee virus and as if any of that is going to help you as if watching somebody whether they be a rabbi or, or or a medical expert is going to help you in any way shape or form in fact all it does is create more worry more anxiety more conspiracy uh, and, and whether the conspiracy is not really a conspiracy or it's real and whether there's a new world order or is an old world order none of that is actually going to solve anybody's problems and the fact is it's actually going to create additional anxiety and additional distance from god because the more worried you are about men the more distant you are from the god who created men and therefore when you talk to people you can't help yourself but feel bad for them that they're on the road of er enonan and not the road of pinchas or bnei koach that are that arrived at peace what's the difference between the two er enonan went after whatever they thought made sense they thought that you know they should protect beauty for beauty's sake and if they want to reproduce then simply get some side gig for that get something else for that but beauty has to be 
uh, you know, uh, the top priority in life, in today's world, beauty, materialism, money, and so on. Now, so chasing all of that means that you're also protecting what you have or chasing the dream that may never arrive. And what ends up happening with people like that is they're literally chasing their tail without realizing it's actually their tail. And they live a life that never ends as far as their their anxiety until it's too late when they realize that all of their anxieties were for nothing in fact most of their anxiety was self-inflicted most of their problems were self-inflicted and they were not even close to a road of success on the other hand when people are actually chasing peace the first thing they do is realize that staying on their current road is certainly not going to get them to peace but getting to the one that owns peace getting to the one that creates peace getting to the one and only that has peace is the road to peace and thereby lies the wisdom that a person needs to acquire in order to achieve peace now if you ask the average person would you like wisdom the average person would usually say yes unfortunately the average person is not really going to know what wisdom is they'll think that wisdom is something that maybe you get with age uh even though there are many stupid people that are not wise even at 80 years old and the Gemara says that people that do not know Torah and their Amea their ignoramuses they become more foolish as they get older not wiser whereas Talmidei Chachamim the Torah scholars actually get more sharp and more wise over time so in fact waiting for that wisdom to arrive just because you aged is simply a fool's errand on the other hand people that are looking into the Torah and say well there's wisdom there there's enough wisdom there to make it last for the last few thousand years and outsell every other wisdom that ever existed and quite frankly any wisdom out there that has any bit of truth in it already exists in the Torah so when a person looks into the Torah and you tell them do you want some wisdom they'll tell you yes but they won't really have much of an idea of how to acquire it one of the things that people assume is that you need to have a very good memory in order to acquire wisdom now although having a good memory is a very good thing and people always ask me well how did you go from this to that and you know I have some people that ask me strange questions and quite frankly make me very uncomfortable uh to answer some of these questions because they think I'm a whole lot more than what I really am but in their eyes I'm very smart and I'm very this and I'm very that and quite frankly if you actually ever met real Torah scholars that I know you'd realize that I could only be in hopes dust under their feet but we aspire we try we learn we do whatever we can to acquire wisdom at the very least we know we're on the right path we're not deluding ourselves the same token when I look at other people that perhaps <clears throat> 8 10 15 years ago 10 20 years ago were in the same place that I was I look at them today and not only are they still in the same place that I was they're actually in a worse place today as they deteriorated over the last 15 or 20 years so you arrived at a certain level of peace a certain level of wisdom a certain level of knowledge you have a a certain understanding of how the world operates and you're not nervous about quite frankly anything while they're more nervous than ever before even though they have more possessions they're more stressed out they're more alone they're more sick they're more everything negative but nothing really has changed for them in a negative way I mean they've acquired the possessions uh, that they wanted or at the very least much more than what they used to have they acquired a lot of the different things that they wanted but yet their life deteriorated so if you look at the argument of if I get rich and I get my stuff then I'll be happy and you live long enough to see all of those people that chase it arrive at what they wanted you'll actually be very disappointed that despite them reaching their goals happiness is nowhere near now when it comes to wisdom those that do acquire wisdom you'll see that as they acquire more and more wisdom they actually do become happier and in fact one of the things that is important for a person to know is that although having a good memory is very good it's not necessarily within your control uh, as much as you think it is and quite frankly it's not necessarily as critical as people think 
Now, Rabbi Ephraim Sheikhye brought in his Achtov Israel Perik Aleph, which he published something around maybe 15 or so, almost 20 years ago. Uh, this, this Sefer has an endless amount of wisdom, and in his Siman Yud Bet, in section 12, I guess in uh, English you would call it chapter 12, he brings one of the Chachamim from around 500, 600 years ago, a very interested interesting and actually a troubled chacham someone that uh was considered really uh, uh, uh you know very wise as far as uh, very smart as far as torah knowledge but had a very unusual and unstable life he was one of the chachamim in italy and his name was uh arav uh, uh arav did modina and in his sefer leva the the uh, the heart of the lion in uh, Perik Aleph, in the sur- first chapter, he writes that there is no man, according to him, out there that is either a scholar or a merchant that does not desire to have better memory and, in fact, have very strong memory, very good memory. Because one that has very good memory Robert Fryam writes in his uh, you know quotes him uh it helps him in all of his tasks it helps him protects him from from danger uh it's it's extremely helpful uh and uh everyone needs it whether for their learning or for their uh, for their business in every t- uh, in every issue and uh there is a everyone out there is chasing it and and looking for it as if it's a endless well whether he is a posek or he's a uh, darshan a lecturer uh the uh especially those types of people the the need for a strong memory is even more necessary because it will help them to have the uh, uh an easier time arriving at the right conclusion uh rather than being uh you know needing to read the same thing a hundred a hundred times like the sages told us that if you want to remember something read it 100 times so not everybody has the time and ability to read everything a hundred times and if you could simply remember it after one or two times of reading it surely you're better off for it now he says that it's a uh having this great memory is something that will help you in your torah studies will help you in your profession so it's obvious and everyone agrees having a good memory is necessary but if we look into the Gemara in Masechet Megillah page 6b in the name of Rabbi Yitzchak who says if someone tells you I labored in the study of Torah but I did not succeed don't believe him if he tells you I have labored in Torah, yet I did succeed. I'm sorry, I have not labored in Torah, and yet I did succeed. Meaning, I don't uh, study Torah every day, but I know a lot of Torah. Don't believe him. Don't believe him. If, however, he tells you, I have labored in the study of Torah, and I have succeeded, believe him. Someone tells you, listen, this is the answer. How do you know? Well, I learned a lot of Torah. Okay, you can take that to the bank. You can believe him. But if he tells you a, uh, you know, something that sounds off, like someone told me today, I don't think that, uh, you know, the, uh, a person should uh, be righteous in order to uh, marry a righteous woman. I, in fact, I think that uh, God should send each person that's not righteous a very righteous woman and she's gonna make them do tshuva and of course I like to toy with some of these people just to see if they have any common sense whatsoever because they claim to be religious sometimes and I ask him where where is your Torah source where is your Torah source that says that God should give uh, a person uh, a righteous woman uh, even though he's not righteous and he says, well, it says, and I think in a Gemara somewhere, that any woman is uh, a woman that uh, will fall for lust, and therefore, that's how I arrive at my conclusion. 
Number one, it doesn't say that. Number two, it's a very stupid conclusion. But of course, this is not something I can tell him. I can just simply tell him what you're saying is not at source and it has nothing to do with your point. Now, the key thing is to know is that did this person study or not? I don't have to tell you. Obviously, he doesn't study. But somebody that did study and would give you a an issue, an argument, and then you would ask him what's the answer to this argument, and they give you an answer, and you ask him how do you know, and they give you a source, and you tell him, well, how do you know the source? And he said, well, I studied the source for several hours just yesterday or last week or six years ago, whenever it was, and I studied night toil and Torah, and it's part of my day-to-day life. It's not just something that I do for, uh, for a hobby. Then, of course, you can take that to the bank and say, okay, this is something that's worth listening to. This is something that uh, uh, you could... Uh, uh, apply to uh, to uh, to what he's saying because it has merit. Why? Because he toiled for his Torah. Someone that says that he has the answers, but he without toil, you cannot believe anything that they say because their natural inclination will be the opposite of what the Torah says. Now, the Torah says that the, the uh, when it comes to the tr- true Torah study. Uh, this is what's necessary, to toil in it. On the other hand, when it comes to business, the very same Gemara says, business, it doesn't matter how much you toil. Meaning that, as the Gemara in Masechet Beitzah, page 16, and also Masechet Rosh Hashanah, same page 16, says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu already decided how much money you're going to make on Rosh Hashanah, or how much money a person will lose. Now, the Gemara here completes that sentence and actually solidifies it by telling you that while Torah, in order for you to acquire this Torah, you have to toil. There is no way for you to naturally have it or be born with it or gifted it without having any effort. It has to be through toil. Work, business success, money, that has nothing to do with toil which is quite the opposite of of the mentality today, of the common wisdom today. Most people think, if I work harder, then I'll make more money. If I have more companies, then I'll make more money. If I have more ideas, then I'll make more money. If I have more this, then I'll have more money, and more money, and more money, and more money. But yet you have people in some of the best professions in the world asking to quit because they can't take it, because they can't afford it, because they've lost everything they have. So the Gemara actually says that when it comes to business, it has nothing to do with toil. In fact, it's quite the opposite, that success in one's business is dependent on siyata dishmaya, divine assistance. In so many words, a kadosh baruch hu is going to decide how much you're going to make regardless of how many hours you spend working, whether you work four hours a day or 40. It doesn't really make much of a difference. The key is to know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the only one that can decide how much that toil is going to yield you. Now, lastly, the, the Gemara says that even with Torah study, there is a siyata dishmaya needed. What is this siyata dishmaya needed for Torah study? Good memory. Good memory, the very same one that the Chacham from Italy said is something that everybody lusts for everybody wants whether they are torah scholars or otherwise good memory is something that in torah is something that requires siyata dishmaya if somebody uh uh, is there's obviously certain people that are born with certain uh, uh amount of memory and but it's not necessarily always used for torah for that to be applied to torah requires divine assistance now you see that there are many people with a good memory and a good head on their shoulders, but all they can remember is, you know, telephone numbers and screen names and salary caps. So even with Torah study, the Gemara says this was not said in regards to understanding, but rather with regards to retaining one's learning. One's success is dependent on Siyat Dishmaya. So the, uh, the memory of everything that you learned is dependent on divine assistance while the success in your learning as far as understanding it is dependent on hard work furthermore the gemara in masechet nida page 70b says 
that what should a person do in order to become a Torah scholar? Rabbi Yoshua says, Amar la'en, yarbe b'yeshiva, that he should spend more time studying in the yeshiva, meaning studying Torah, and spend less time engaged in business. So here we see a little bit of a more details on what the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat said. We're trying to acquire peace. We're going to get to that soon. But to acquire peace, we figured we need wisdom. So wisdom, we figured that we need good memory in order to remember all the different things that we're going to learn if the wisdom is the wisdom of the Torah. Torah already told us, Gemara already told us that yes, you need to learn Torah and it's all based on your effort. But as far as remembering everything, you need divine assistance. Fine. Now, where the Gemara is telling us a little bit more. It's telling us that if you actually want to be a Torah scholar, you want to know a lot of Torah, not only should you spend more time studying Torah, but you actually have to spend less time engaged in business. It's not saying don't work. It's simply saying less time in business. Now, the Chachamim came, uh, came to uh, Rabbi Yoshua, the Chachamim from Alexandria, said, Arbea Asukin, that uh, many people have done the, that where they learned a lot more, they spent more time in yeshiva, and yet it didn't help them. So Rabbi Yeshua says they should plead for mercy from him who wisdom belongs to. As it says in uh, Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, for Hashem grants wisdom from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. So already here we see that, wait a minute, you told me initially that the uh, wisdom is going to come from me toiling in Torah. And memory is going to come from divine assistance. Now you're telling me that wisdom is going to come from not just toiling it's it's it actually is, that also is divine assistance so which one is it is it divine assistance or is it toiling Rabbi Yeshua clarifies he says in, in uh, Rabbi Chia uh, uh, clarifies he says that there is this is an example of, of, of how to explain all of this as an analogy where there's a king who held a banquet for his servants and he sends to his friends portions of whatever is before him this is like Hashem that he is the one that owns all the wisdom and since you arrived at his party by learning his Torah he's going to give you some of that wisdom so now if the attainment of wisdom depends upon prayer meaning it depends on divine assistance why did Rabbi Yeshua teach us initially that he should spend more time learning in Shiva. Shouldn't we just pray all day? So Rabbi Yeshua responds said, no. If you want to have, you want to be a Torah scholar, meaning not just learn and fulfill your role as, 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 an, as a Jew, but actually want to arrive at, uh, at, at wisdom, it requires both. One is not enough without the other. So here we see that learning Torah is not just something that a person needs to toil they also need divine assistance and remembering all of it needs divine assistance now the midrash in parashat achremot sefer vaikra midrash rabba in uh siman kaf gimel says in the name of rabbi shimon ben gamliel who says yosef at tzaddik was rewarded from heaven as a result of his deeds <clears throat> he got all types of things initially he was young man living in the house of his father Yaakov his, bro- his brothers thought that he was trying to kill them <clears throat> and therefore they sold him obviously they made a mistake needless to say this was all the hand of Hashem and after being a prisoner in Egypt for 12 years he became the viceroy in Egypt and got an extraordinary amount of wealth and power and so on. So Rabban Gamliel says that what Yosef at Siddiq was gifted 
from heaven was a result of his actions regarding his mouth that did not kiss Potiphar's wife when she wanted to sin with him her name by the way was Zlicha Zlicha Z-L-I uh, uh, I guess C-H-A Zlicha she wanted to sin with him and because he did not sin with her he did not kiss her HaKadosh Baruch Hu rewarded him in a uh, where uh, Paro said to Mosh- said to Yosef on your mouth shall all my people kiss meaning in so many words all of my people millions and millions of Egyptians are going to listen to whatever comes out of your mouth regarding his neck that he did not bend to commit sin he didn't look at even the uh the immodesty of Zlicha who was very very beautiful the Gemara says she was one of the four most beautiful women that ever lived and Yosef did not even allow himself to entertain her beauty and look at it even though she was trying to change her outfits multiple times a day just to get him to look at her since his neck did not bend to commit sin didn't uh, you turn around like everybody turns around every time a chihuahua passes next to them the verse says Hashem rewarded him where he placed a gold chain upon his neck where one of the things that Perot gave him was a very special necklace which was not only very expensive but also a showed a, uh, a certain uh, power that he had a position of power regarding Yosef at Sadiq's hands that did not feel innocent meaning he did not even touch he did not touch anything not himself not uh Zlicha, the, the Eshet Potiphar he also got rewarded for that as Paro removed his own ring from his hand and put it on Yosef's hands where Yosef at Sadiq got through that ring the ultimate power of among the Egyptian people and at some point later on in the world because the entire world got uh, to a point of poverty and had to come to Yosef at Sadiq to get food regarding his body that did not touch sin the verse says he then had him dressed in garments of fine linen regarding his feet that did not walk to cut to commit sin the verse says he had him ride in his second chariot and regarding Yosef's mind God said the mind that did not think in sin should come and become and be called wise that wisdom that was gifted to Yosef at Sadiq was something to out of this world how do we know first the verse says everyone called him Avrech Avrech means that he was you know today Avrech means a Torah scholar but in those days Avrech means that he was the Av the uh the 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 father of all wisdom he was the smartest man of the land and we realize that Yosef at Sadiq was not only a extraordinary prophet that he was gifted this prophecy of what's going to happen in the future but was also a genius because he had an exact strategy of how to save Egypt how to preserve the crops while others tried to also listen to him and preserve the crops nobody else succeeded nobody else succeeded to preserve their crops for so many years and so on even till this day the people don't have the same technology and ability and wisdom that Yosef at Sadiq had and not only that he preserved enough in such a fashion that literally there was enough for it to go around to the entire country without causing hyperinflation like you have in the world today without causing deflation without causing a banking crisis without bankrupting or cause, causing a revolt meaning the wisdom that Yosef at Sadiq had was truly second to none it was unbelievable what type of wisdom that he had why did he get this wisdom here we see it has nothing to do with what the Gemara initially told us the Gemara told us if you want to have this wisdom you have to learn Torah you have to pray for it 
Here we see there's a third part. What's the third part? Mesirut nefesh, self-sacrifice. But not just any self-sacrifice, self-sacrifice to stay away from sins, especially at the moment of truth where you have the big tests. Now, do we have this as just maybe is an exception or is this actually paskin lalacha? Says the Rambam in Ilchot Isure Be'a, in chapter 22, the last alacha, uh, alacha number 21, where it says a person should distance himself from levity, intoxication, flirtation, for they are great precipitators and steps leading to forbidden relations. A man should not live without a wife, for having a wife leads to great purity. This has to do with our other series about Jewish intimacy. The Rambam apparently says the same thing, where you can achieve the highest level of purity through that relation with man and his wife. And then the Rambam continues and elaborates on something extraordinary. And he says the following. Our sages gave even greater advice saying a person should always turn himself and his thoughts to the words of torah and expand his knowledge and wisdom for the thoughts of forbidden relations grow strong solely in the heart which is empty of wisdom as shlomo amelech said in proverbs chapter 5 verse 19 it is a beloved hind arousing favor her breast will satisfy you at all times you shall be obsessed with her love here the the uh, uh rambam is again doing the same thing what the uh sefer chasidim did as shlomo melech did where in essence the love that a person is supposed to have for torah because they understand that wisdom is there literally has to be like the love that they have for their wife because if a person understood what gift the torah gives them just without even talking about heaven and 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 going and having a wonderful kids but simply what it gives you individually literally a person would love the torah more than he loves anything else in the world how so every man that wants to be loyal to his wife wants to have a good family wants to have kids that have a father and 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 someone to look up to and not somebody that's some womanizer at the age of 60 are looking is looking for stability and one of the main things that causes one to have stability is when there is a healthy relationship between him and his wife now it's impossible to have a healthy relationship with your wife if your mind is constantly thinking about other women in fact it's impossible for you to have a healthy relationship with your wife even if your wife doesn't know that you're thinking about other women and you call her beautiful and you say i love you baby but in reality you're thinking about other women you're still not going to have shlombait. Why? Because although her body may not know that you are cheating on her with your mind, even during the times that you're intimate, her neshama does know. And in fact, those desires that a person has for other women is only going to grow so long as they don't replace it with Torah. So the Rambam says that if you want to have the ability to not only reach the ultimate purity in relations between you and your wife but also you want to have a head that is absent of immorality doesn't have immorality in it doesn't think about that garbage doesn't want to have anything to do with it of course the yetzara will attack at all types of times but you can easily kick that yetzara out without that much effort how do you do it have a lot of torah in your mind because that immorality is only going to enter your mind if there's room room that is created because of a lack of torah learning so now a person already sees that wait that toil for torah is not just in order for me to acquire wisdom it's not in order for me just to uh get the merit to have a good memory and to pray for it but actually that toil for torah could actually allow me to no longer think of sins no longer think of things that cause shlombite problems no longer think of things that are causing me to remain single no longer causing me to waste seed and in fact 
even if a person says yes but rabbi i don't uh waste seed anymore but it still comes out at night when i go to sleep well guess what that's not by itself it's not coming out by itself when you're sleeping just because god wants to pick on you that's usually also your doing how do we know simple Chachamim taught us this where do we see it a few places Rabotai. a few places we see the Chachamim teach us about why does a person have nocturnal emission. Now, of course, if a person has is doing tshuva, is protecting their eyes, is not uh, looking at anything forbidden, and they're still having these nocturnal emissions while they sleep, this is simply the outcome of your past, which if you continue staying strong and continue adding more and more Torah to your life, this will eventually end too. But a person that's still looking at anything that walks or even just sometimes looks at things that are forbidden and still thinks that it's okay to sin once in a while not all the time but just once in a while surely they should expect the nocturnal emissions to continue and in fact none of the blessing that they want to ever arrive why says the say the chachamim in a sefer called or torah of the magid in page 181 and he says the following that the thoughts of sin the thoughts of immorality you think about things that are forbidden to you this by the way also applies to women you think about another man that is not your husband you think about whatever you think about that's forbidden to you those thoughts the Gemara in Masechet Yoma says the thoughts of sin are worse than the sin and we've discussed several times why the thoughts are so much worse one of the main things that Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin says is the thoughts of sin are worse than the sin because your thoughts are like your Yichud room with a Kadosh Baruch Hu. It's like the Kodesh Kodeshim. You just invited a prostitute to the Kodesh Kodeshim where only a Kadosh Baruch Hu knows about it, meaning you're only offending God with those foreign thoughts. So this is not exactly such a good look when you're asking Hashem to give you a good memory or Parnasa or really anything else. But nonetheless, there's another reason where the old Torah says why the thoughts of sin are really terrible and worse than the sin, if you will. Now, of course, the sin is worse, but the thoughts have a much worse impact on a person before the actual sin ever comes. Why? The thoughts of sin create a klipa souls, meaning the thoughts themselves actually create a soul. Soul of a klipa, soul of something that wants to harm you this soul that's created through that thought searches for a body to enter and therefore when that person thinks of forbidden matters these souls visit that person at night and cause them to have a nocturnal emission which they can then use as bodies for their souls in so many words when a person allows themselves to look at anything that's forbidden whether it's on the screen or in real life or a combination thereof or whatever it is they're creating a problem for themselves what are they creating a problem they may not see the problem but later that night or later that week they will see that problem and say yeah but I, I didn't mean it no you didn't mean it then you meant it before now of course everyone knows that those types of things obviously have not uh, not such a uh, not such a good impact on a person's uh, tshuva and not such a good impact on a person's life because the uh, when a seed comes out of a man's body so does his parnasa so does his mazal motzi zera lebatala is the acronym for mazal fortune wasting seed is also says the uh, the Grot Moshe in Eben Ha'ezel wasting seed equally applies to women and those that do so increase the mazikim the evil spirits and the klipot this is actually in uh, Shah Kavanot in Yan Drush and Rav Moshe Feinstein says it's forbidden according to Halakha for women to uh, uh, waste seed if you will to do whatever they're doing on their own on the prohibition against entertaining forbidden thoughts so here we see that the Ramban said those forbidden thoughts are simply going to kick out any wisdom that wants to enter 
the forbidden thoughts themselves are not just going to kick out the wisdom, but they're going to create all types of demons and mazikim that are hurting the person in panasa, in wisdom, in family matters, in zivug, and everything else. And here we're just talking about the thoughts that lead to action. The Chida says in his sefer called Avodat HaKodesh, Tipor and Shamir, Siman, Tet. The tikkun for wasting seed for Pgama Brit is to make other people do tshuva, specifically for wasting seed. Because just like someone wasted the seed, which is the sparks of holiness, the sparks of Kedusha that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave them, whether they did it intentionally or otherwise, still it was wasted. You wasted sparks of Kedusha. By helping other people do tshuva, he will now be able to collect them and connect them to the source. Meaning that a person that made all types of mistakes in their life can now gain back that mistake if he or she helps other people do tshuva for this specific issue. Now, of course, most people do not have the ability or the knowledge to help people do tshuva hence the reason why we print out all of these cds and usbs and have all these movies and the shurim and so on because you could simply press share or press donate or press something in order to uh do let us do the job for you but in so many words a person that is trying to acquire this wisdom which will eventually get him to this peace that he wants the first and foremost that he realizes is that don't ruin it before you even try to acquire it don't ruin it because even if a person learns all day but they continue looking at immoral things they continue looking at immodest things they continue to operate like an immodest person whatever they're learning is not giving them any more wisdom or any more merits but in fact it's giving more merits and more power to the other side sitra akhra Now, Shlomo Amedach says, lust broken, which means lust being overcome, is sweet to the soul. But turning from evil, meaning doing tshuva, is an abomination to fools. Rashi says that fools detest the very idea that they should ever give up their wickedness. If you see somebody that you tell them the truth about Torah, about mitzvot, about changing, about acquiring wisdom, good life, holiness, and you see them simply cringe, that's because they're a wicked person. Now, wickedness doesn't go away. It's not gas. It's not air. It's not a, uh, a, a, a bad dream wickedness grows over time if it's not addressed and Shlomo Amelech says that those wicked people if they don't do tshuva they're only going to get worse because they detest the very idea that you're even telling them to change so unless your strategy of helping them do tshuva works expect the next time you try to help them for them to be a tougher cookie than they were today still you don't necessarily need to give up on them try again but nonetheless if a person doesn't do tshuva each time you try with them they get much more difficult i had one person tell me just uh the uh, the other day they wanted some help they wanted to ask some serious questions that they had their whole life about all types of mystical things and all types of this and all types of that and anxieties and ta 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 i spent between the messages that went back and forth because i don't have phone calls so it's messages i spent nearly an hour on this person literally nearly an hour on this person and given them messages and so on and uh, all types of answers and i addressed every single one of their questions only to get the eventual message which is i don't know i just don't jive with you it's uh, i think that what you're what you're saying is toxic i'll pray for you this person doesn't even keep kashrut this person walks around like literally there's no difference between their outfit and a cow both are wearing just as much clothes but they want to pray for me because i'm the one that's toxic even though i spent an hour of my life addressing every question that they have for free why 
because the answers require a person to change even if you don't tell them directly the answers do that and if a person is so glued and literally cleaves to the wickedness of their actions the thought of changing literally repels them now you don't give up on such a person if they come back the door is still open even though you insulted even though you're nasty even though you're mean because i know it's not you it's not the you that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created. It's the you that you created. The you that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created is beautiful and wonderful and amazing and righteous and, and all the greatest things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants. It's just that all of those sins and foreign thoughts and horrible behavior that you added to your life literally make you look like, you know, what those people pick up in the streets after their dogs relieve themselves that's unfortunately what you did to your soul so i can't be mad at you for it i used to be the same thing i'm trying very hard not to be so you have to really think about helping people but at the same time you're helping yourself why because you have to know at all times that the person you're helping is not the person you're helping the person you're helping is the future is that wonderful person that person that will thank you for the rest of their life that person that will raise a beautiful family full of righteous people that person that will do all the wonderful things in the world the person that you're helping though at the same time is really nasty ungrateful and a whole lot of other things but it's not really that person because that person is the person that hates torah hates musar hates righteousness because that's the stuff that tells them they have to be the other person and they don't really know how good it feels to be the real version of them says the gaon mi vilna a person that attains the this righteousness this good can do so by nullifying his own will that is constantly yearning for lust by nullifying that will and replacing it with the will of God that person could literally get to the highest possible levels of holiness so no matter what a person has done in their life they can eventually arrive at a very high level of holiness and thereby wisdom and needless to say the peace that we started talking about now of course when they're studying Torah they have to know that sometimes you need a partner sometimes you need somebody to help you because you don't know what you don't know sometimes having a partner is the worst thing you could ever do for yourself why because you need to learn with people that are better than you if you learn with your friends that are in the same place as you sometimes it makes matters worse in fact if you even learn from someone that calls themselves a teacher whether it be a rabbi or otherwise that does not by default make them better than you why because if you are learning in order to improve yourself in order to improve your holiness in order to improve your connection to Hashem but your teacher is an arrogant person whether they're a rabbi rabbinit or not you're never going to arrive at your conclusion in fact you will actually get worse over time how do I know well, the Gemara in Masechet Moed Katan, page 17b, says so, but also the Sefer Hasidim, my new favorite Sefer, says the following in a section in the first chapter under the section under the question that the Sefer Hasidim answered 800 years ago: Should one study alone or with a partner? The Chacham says sometimes a student is better off studying by himself than with a partner, as we say in the uh, in the Proverbs. Your, uh, chapter 5 verse 17 your wellsprings will be yours alone others having no part with you then again another student will be more successful if he studies with a partner or under a teacher so when is studying on one's own preferable than studying with a teacher if a student has a teacher or a study partner who is arrogant and who will not concede his errors or is a teacher who is short-tempered and the student is afraid of being punished if he does not know the answer to a question or the teacher is unqualified because he has bad character traits because he is not modest 
because he is selfish, because he is somebody that has bad midot. In all of these cases, the person is better off studying alone. Otherwise, he might tend to flatter his teacher or study partner. And in every situation, he should bear in mind the passage in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 1. Consider well who is before you. Many people have asked me a question in in the last several months about a certain teacher I'm not going to mention. That is a questionable teacher. Why questionable teacher? Doesn't look like a teacher. Looks more like somebody that came out of some movie. Looks like somebody that looks like they should be in some runway show they don't look anything like a teacher but nonetheless they're a person that is teaching teaching in the name of big rabbis and so on and so forth and they ask me listen am i should i continue studying with this person because they're becoming more and more popular what do you think i said to them in each and every single one of them by you asking me the question that means you already know the answer no one asks should i study from a really good rabbi no one asks, should I continue studying with someone that's righteous? The only time people ask those types of questions is when something is wrong and even the average person can see it. If your teacher looks like one of the Chachamim, one of the Tzadikim, one of the people that's part of our tradition for the last several thousand years and acts like them, surely you should study with them. But if your teacher looks more modern than you, if your teacher talks about materialism even more than you, if your teacher is more concerned about their looks even more than you if your teacher literally is just somebody that looks nothing like any of the sages and quite frankly doesn't really repeat any of their words they quote more of the secular knowledge than they do the torah knowledge and in fact the secular knowledge is the dominant force in most of the lectures or the videos or whatever it is what are you studying really what wisdom are you studying what are you getting out of this And you see that this is not where it ends because the lectures are usually the best version of the teacher. When those teachers do things privately, the private guidance, the private conversations, which, you know, we merited to to listen to some of these private guidances and messages and so on. Literally, you would think you're talking to a gangster. I don't know, somebody that just came out of, uh, I don't know, some type of rated R film full of cussing, full of filth, full of garbage, and you're still actually asking me, should you study with this teacher? Are you deaf or stupid? Which one is it? Because surely there shouldn't be a question. But here you see, the problem is this teacher tells me that I'm perfectly good and I don't really need to change the things that I don't want to change. I should change the things that I want to change. You know, the things that will make me make more money, the things that will make me feel physically better. Well, what about being more righteous with Hashem? What about being more modest? What about being more holy? No, we didn't get to that yet. How long are you learning with this teacher? I don't know, three years? Three years you haven't gotten to holiness yet? When are you going to get there? After you died? So they do the, uh, the, the uh, they'll, they'll teach over your body about uh, Tuma and Kedusha? When are you going to get the holiness? When are you going to get to anything that's of actual Torah value? So you see, Rabotai, one of the greatest things that a person can see from the words of the Chachamim is they never fail. Their words are as solid as stone. Now, of course, at times a person will question a Chacham because they don't understand the Chacham. And what the Chacham says seems like it doesn't make any sense. And what the Chacham says seems like it perhaps goes against our emotional little weak hearts. I'll give you an example. Fantastic story, true story. Years ago, there was a great Chacham. A Chacham that's still alive to this day through his Torah. His body went to Gan Eden with the rest of the Tzadikim. His name was Rav Moshe Feinstein. Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zecher Tzadik Kadosh Livracha, was not just a Chacham, he was a Gadol Adol, he was a giant, a giant among giants. When Rav Ovadia, Allah Shalom, came to visit him, when he came to America to come visit Rav Moshe Feinstein, he actually told his driver, please pray for me that I could survive being next to this holy person. That's how holy Rav Moshe Feinstein was. 
Now, he wasn't always in America. He was in Russia under the communist rule. These Russians hated the Torah. They were communist, and unfortunately, some of the worst ones were called Yevsekzia, and they were actually the Jewish communists. They hated the Jews even more than the non-Jews hated the Jews, which is actually always promised in the Torah, Masechet Psachim, where it says that the uh, the Amearatzot, the people that are ignorant of Torah, hate Talmidei Chachamim even more than the Goim do, even more than Esav hates us. That's one of the craziest statements in the world, but you actually see it in real life, and you'll see it in this in this story. So Rav Moshe Feinstein was in Russia in a place called Luba. He was the Rav over there, and the communists over there did whatever they could to torture him. Take his money, take this, just to get him out of there, because they simply did not want Judaism in Russia. They wanted everybody to be an atheist, uh, 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 somebody that's anti-Torah and so on, similar to some of the people in the Israeli government today and also in America, all the reformers. So anyway, Rav Moshe Feinstein knew that if he left Russia, then the entire community is going to fall apart. So he literally stood there through fire, fire of Genom, just to stay there, just to stay there with his family. One day they decided, that's it. Because you are a rabbi, we have to tax you a very high tax rate. In so many words, all of your salary, not not 50%, 100% of your salary that you get we have to get it as taxes, meaning you have zero income. Rav Moshe Feinstein says, no problem, you could take 100% of my income, but I'm still not leaving. He had to leave his house with his family and live on a side little room that, that, that was attached to the synagogue with his wife, his kids, and two other families. Literally a room that's probably not bigger than my office over here. But yet, despite the difficulties, he learned and learned and learned a lot of time and tried to help the community as much as humanly possible. One day, there was a rasha, somebody evil, like literally an evil among evil. Now, you not, may not see it initially, but you'll see it eventually. You see, this evil person was a Jew, and he hated Jews, so much so that he made it his business to go tell the communists about any Jew in the Jewish community that had money that he didn't give the government that had possessions that he didn't give the government. And he would tell on them, and that's how he made his life, that's how he made his living, being a rat, being a, a, a moisel. And many times, those Jews that were caught by the government would be murdered, would be killed by the government. And this wicked Rasha Merusha eventually got old and gray and sick, as it happens to many people. And he decided that he's dying and therefore he should have a last will and testament. He called the Hevra Kadisha, you know, the Jewish people, righteous people that bury all the Jewish people. And he said, listen, I'm dying. And I know that I did many bad things in my life. And of course, the Jewish community is surely unhappy with me. And I just want you to know that I understand and I accept what I did and I would like to be buried with my face down as an embarrassment, as an atonement for some of my crimes that maybe they'll forgive me in heaven. You know, because usually the bodies are buried facing up. I want to be facing down as a embarrassing. That's my last will and testament. Shortly after, this evil Rasha Merusha dies. Baruch Hashem. Chavra Kadisha has this last will and testament. Now, if you have this last will and testament, and the average person has the last will and testament, and the guy says, bury me upside down, that's all he wants. Do you care? Bury him upside down. He's a Rasha. He should be buried upside down. That's what the Torah-less mind thinks. The Torah mind thinks, okay, he can want whatever he wants. I have to find out what the Torah says. How do I find out what the Torah says? Go to the Chacham. Oh, Rav Moshe Feinstein. And Rav Moshe Feinstein says, we do not take into account anybody's request, whether alive or dead, that goes against our Torah, that goes against our tradition. 
And it doesn't matter what he did during his life, and it doesn't matter what he requested before he died, we do not bury people facing down. That's the psak. Now, you would think, wow, that's kind of insensitive. That's not nice. Let the guy be buried down. He needs the atonement. No. You don't go against Rav Moshe Feinstein. Why? Because going against him can mean losing lives. Shortly after they buried the body exactly as the Allah says, exactly as Rav Moshe Feinstein decreed. And everyone walks away and only two days pass where the police of the communists barge into the Jewish community synagogue yelling and screaming saying we want to be shown the body of this person that just died two days ago now, of course our tradition is not to open graves but life was at risk so it was you know there's nothing you can do they go they open the grave and the police see the body facing up like all other Jewish bodies and get upset and disappointed and walk away now initially people were confused why do they want to see a body only to find out that this evil monster accumulated so much tuma so much impurity so many sins that he hated his own brothers his own fellow jews so much that he went and he gave the communist a letter that told him those jews are going to desecrate my body and embarrass me even after i die and take their revenge against me by burying me upside down make sure to punish each and every single one of them that are responsible for it meaning this monster was so horrible that he wanted to hurt the jewish community even after he left this world and only because the jewish community listened to the pure neshama and genius mind of torah of rav moshe feinstein did they save their own lives you see rabotai karim when a person sanctifies themselves not only do they grow in wisdom where they no longer have the worries of the day-to-day life because they know that hashem runs the world they no longer have the worries of who's out to get them because they know that hashem runs the world they have no worries about being alone or being this or being that because again they know hashem runs the world but better yet when the people around them have difficulties have issues have all types of anxieties they could be the first one to tell everybody hashem runs the world perhaps you should learn more with me than learning about new world orders and conspiracy theories and reptilian men and all types of runway models that people that claim to know torah but they quote many christian teachers instead and all types of other mumbo jumbo learn torah and you'll see the kedusha and the wisdom and needless to say the peace we all would like to have with that being said i'm gonna have a drink and you guys can ask as many questions as you'd like
Okay, let's see. First question I see is... Oh, it's not a question. Here we go. What can one do as a vessel to help fellow Jews for refuah shlema, getting married, shlom bayit, having children, and doing tshuva? The ultimate thing that a person can do is to, to help people is by helping them do tshuva. Now, the ultimate way to make yourself into a vessel to help people do tshuva, meaning that Hashem has to choose you to use you as a vessel to help his kids come home. Because for you to help another child of Hashem to come back home to do tshuva means that Hashem is now in debt to you another 310 worlds in heaven. And also, if you do it on a regular basis, he has to give you special protection in this world against sins. Because it says, Kol arabim en chet ba'al yado. The Mishnah Masechet Avot says that a person that helps people do tshuva, Hashem even protects them from sins. So there's a lot of stuff that's being given to somebody that helps people do tshuva. And therefore, not everybody succeeds in helping people do tshuva because they have not sanctified themselves enough for Hashem to want to use them. So the, in order to help people the most, you need to help them do tshuva. In order to uh, make yourself, turn yourself into the vessel that's capable of helping people do tshuva, you have to sanctify yourself the most. Sanctifying yourself means, number one, of course, learning Torah each day. Number two, being as holy as possibly be, meaning that when it comes to morality, when it comes to modesty, both for men and for women, uh, when it comes to uh, doing chesed, and most importantly, when it comes to mesirut nefesh, sacrifice, a person has to exert all of their energy. If they, The more they exert of their energy to do all of these things, the more they'll succeed because the more pure the vessel becomes. The less energy they exert, the less successful they'll be. So you'll see sometimes there are certain people that even if they speak okay, they, they say nice things, 20 years they've been giving speeches, maybe they helped 100 people do tshuva, 50 people, 10 people, I met one guy that uh, was already in the Kiruv world for, uh, I think, close to 25 or even almost 30 years. And when uh, we asked him, how many people uh, have you helped do tshuva? He proudly said 100. Now again, 100 people helping them do tshuva is fantastic. But over 25, 30 years, quite frankly, it's not fantastic. Let's just say that. Uh, because a person could do a whole lot more than that. You can do that in, in a day if you really if you really exerted yourself enough. You could do that in a week. You could do that in a month. But you could certainly do a lot more than a hundred. Because to make a hundred people do tshuva over twenty five years, that means that you made four people do tshuva every year. Four people do tshuva every year. You shouldn't even be a rabbi. You could just be an average Joe that just gives out CDs once or twice a year, and you can make more people do tshuva than that. So when you really do the numbers, a person. Uh, that uh, you know that exerts themselves a lot more and sanctifies themselves the numbers don't make sense why because you'll see that there are some people that have bigger budgets bigger efforts uh, as far as like they're, they're they have buildings and they have uh, more staff and so on but they don't really get many people to do chuba whereas another person that literally sacrifices everything for it with a shoestring budget could literally make a hundred two hundred people a day do tshuva. Why? One sanctified themselves, one did not. And sanctifying themselves means that a person has to learn Torah each day, no exception, has to be very, very uh, 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 extreme, if you will, when it comes to modesty with no exceptions, modesty with their eyes, modesty with their clothing, modesty with their speech. Uh, They have to be very, very uh, uh, careful when it comes to those things. Morality, uh, and uh, last but not least is to uh, be uh, to push yourself, push yourself beyond the uh, the norm. Now, of course, pushing yourself sometimes means taking flights, going to places, making phone calls, sleeping less, donating a lot of money. Uh, you know, it's, a person needs to simply chase chase the uh, 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 people, uh, not just with phone calls and with a uh, with text messages. But chasing people to do tshuva, meaning by they they are chasing the merits to have the merit to help people do tshuva. Have the merit to do tshuva has to do with you, with yourself. 
you know how much of your money do you care about how much of your uh uh time do you care about if your priority is to make to have a pleasing uh peaceful life just for yourself and you want to help people do chuva just as like a uh a side gig because you want to be nice then yeah perhaps you'll succeed to a certain extent but not much if you want to be a uh you know a the the uh, someone that's uh, a tsunami of kedusha into the community it's going to require a lot of effort uh and also a, a lot of tests a lot of tests but i think one of the places that a lot of people fail in aside from the areas of modesty and immorality and things like that is when it comes to money people either are too cheap to spend money to help people do tshuva or they're too money oriented and they want to make money out of it they want to everything is about making money for them so if it's about money if it's about making money and uh, then it's it's better off a person doesn't do it why because it's it's number one it's not really uh, it's not supposed to be profitable business and uh number two it's a uh you know when a person is uh chasing money it's not possible for them to uh to chase neshamot with the same effort and they can make a lot of wrong decisions a lot of wrong decisions and some of the uh worst stories that i've seen happen to people you know that uh, were chasing money uh next i started reciting the person's name and saying a chapter of Taylim. for example my relative is 22 so i say Taylim 23 for him what else is the effective uh, spiritual remedy like i just said you know do, sanctifying yourself saying Taylim is good but there's more to do than that uh praying for him for sure is good to give stock on his or her behalf do uh, good deeds on his or her behalf uh if you can cry for them that's certainly very good uh you know it's a uh in essence you have to understand that to, to help a person do chuva it's like you're having a child because he, he or she becomes your son or a daughter so you have to as much as a person would cry on their own son or daughter they have to cry on uh, on Hashem's uh, son or daughter even if that son or daughter spit on them in the face and are ungrateful about everything that they did for them get used to it the more successful you are with helping people do tshuva the more you have to wipe your face from the amount of times people will spit on you but again you're not doing it for that version you're doing it for the future version it's uh it's, it comes with the gig it's very hard but it's it's certainly worth it uh is there a necessity to do netila after touching a dog before studying torah or is it a chuma certainly there is a necessity to do it because a dog is tame is impure uh and in fact even if you touch yourself in a hidden part of your body uh you know parts that are hidden usually whether it's your under uh, arms or between your legs or uh, places that are typically hidden uh or if you let's say you scratch your head uh you know you're supposed to wash your hands before you study Torah uh, some chachamim say that if you're studying Torah already and while you're studying Torah you're scratching your head you don't need to uh wash your hands if it's going to stop you uh but if it's before you started studying then certainly you should wash your hands before you study Torah uh but it's it's a without uh without blessing no no blessing just a uh, just washing your hands same thing with the dog next uh are Yosef HaTzadik and Daniel the prophet any related in some way I found a few interesting similarities in them both uh, life stories uh, such as becoming the king's counselor after interpreting his dreams uh, are they related um, let me see we have Shevet Yosef is Daniel one of the descendants of Yosef um, I'm not sure if he's one of the uh, it's possible that uh, Daniel Daniel one of them. I don't know I don't know if, if Daniel I mean Yosef obviously preceded him I'm just not sure if uh, Daniel came which tribe Daniel came to it's uh I never looked into it so if I look into it and I see any connection I'll tell you but um other than that I don't know. why did Hashem pick Bil'am as the prophet for the Goim he was obviously a Rasha why not pick a righteous guy like Job uh well Job was a uh was a uh righteous person uh, but uh, he wasn't in a position to uh, to be against the uh, Torah, against uh, uh, representing the Goyim. He wa- he was a righteous guy, uh, you know, that uh, represented uh, you know it's, it's righteousness. Not uh, he didn't necessarily represent the people. Uh, the uh, the prophet Job 
was given a uh, was given a certain power that uh, he chose to do bad things with it now job uh, uh, chose to do good things with it but not uh, necess- he didn't necessarily have the merit to uh, uh, to go and lead a, a whole people and quite frankly neither did Bilam uh, Bilam led himself uh, job led himself but Bilam with him leading himself he led himself in wickedness and he tried to destroy the Jewish people uh, whereas uh, you know whereas uh, job had a different role in life and he had to uh, um, you know he had to uh, in essence do tshuva for the mistakes that he made uh, I know that the the Chachamim say that he was also uh, the uh, the prophet job or was uh, the uh, reincarnation of uh, Terach Terach the father of Avram Avinu so he had to do a different tikkun a uh, different tikkun of uh, when uh, he served idols in his previous life even though Terach uh, did tshuva he uh, he still there's still uh, idolatry on his record so you had to be reincarnated and suffer trem- tremendously in order to fix it uh, so he had to be reincarnated as Job and there's a verse in uh, the uh, the book of Job that is the exact verse that uh, Terach says uh, by Job where, how he communicates with his uh, wife's calling her a fool uh, so the point is that the, there's the same verse in, in both places and from there the uh, Chachamim I believe it's the Arizal learns that Job was the reincarnation of uh, Terach but again he had a different tikkun a different tikkun in the world Bilam Bilam had a uh, certain power that he could have done a lot of good things with it just like Esav had a uh, certain power that he could have done a lot of good things with and just like Cain Cain could have done a lot of good things but they chose bad Hashem didn't necessarily make them bad by default they chose bad uh, uh, technically the uh, um, Rav Kuli says that uh, Esav was supposed to be a father of six out of the twelve tribes uh, meaning that it was supposed to be six tribes coming from Esav and six tribes coming from Yaakov uh, but because uh, Esav chose evil he lost uh, his right to uh, lead the six of the tribes instead he led the nation of Edom which is the enemy of Am Yisrael. but uh, again Hashem doesn't make a person evil by default people choose evil and then Hashem uses them for whatever they chose so Bilam could have uh, could have uh, chosen to be good and he could have been a uh, similar story to Job but he chose otherwise is it important to give money in certain increments such as 18 to 26 or is it better to just give 19 to 27 dollars respectively uh, should people give as much as they can instead of picking arbitrary values uh, yes pick the highest amount that you could afford to give for the sake of Torah that is certainly much more valuable for your neshama and certainly for the sake of the Torah than some strange number that people pick uh, whether it be 18 or 118 or 116 or all types of other mumbo jumbo numbers that people create that treat Staka like it's the lotto or it's uh what is it bingo bingo it's uh, you're always waiting sometimes when people have the auctions in the shul and people donate and say oh 18 36 54 72 uh 97 108 160 I'm waiting for somebody to say bingo what are you guys picking just say a normal number say a normal number 100 200 500 a million whatever it is just say a normal number there's no need for all of the uh the lucky number nonsense it doesn't have any value whatsoever uh, certainly it's not a mitzvah and quite frankly I think it reminds people of bad things but again it's not forbidden it's just stupid is yore yore only a smicha for shechita or is a general name for any smicha no 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 uh, yore yore is a very high level smicha it's uh, the uh, one of the highest that there is there is a uh, general smicha is uh, just a uh, smicha to be a speaker teacher or or a, or a rabbi of a shul that uh, quite frankly doesn't even need a smicha uh, anybody could uh, get a regular uh, smicha without much effort but then there is a, uh, a certain teaching regimen that a person has to learn uh, in regards to uh, uh, in regards to certain uh, smichot yore yore is a very high level smicha 
There is a, uh, which is one level below the uh, uh, Yedin Yedin. Yedin Yedin is Dayan. That's to be a Dayan. But, I mean, it sounds like it's only one level, so it sounds like tomorrow you're going to be uh, Dayan. No, it's, uh, you know, it's another 10, 20 years of learning. But to get, just put it this way, uh, to get Yore Yore, typically in a normal Kolel, takes, you know, something like... Uh, eight to 12 years to get your yore. Now again, there could be uh, uh, faster ways of learning, which is actually one of the things that Rabbi Ephraim, Bezal Hashem, wants to bring when we open our uh, yeshiva here in America, or call in America, is that he wants to have a fast-paced program, uh, much more intensive, which is to do what he did, let's say, in 10, 12 years, uh, in uh, three to five years. So to get a yore yore within three to five years. Now this obviously is a lot more intensive. It's 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 not easy, but nonetheless it's a uh, it's possible. Uh, he obviously already has a strategy, but but typically to get a yore yore is uh, something that takes somewhere around a decade. Yedin yedin is something that uh, typically will take you know uh, another I don't know seven to 12 years again depending on the level of you know uh commitment as well as how you know how uh how much of a genius the person is and uh so on so uh but uh you know it's it also depends how they got it sometimes there are certain uh smicha that you get uh through testing and a specific learning program and a certain smicha that a person gets uh just by being a gaon mukar uh, where they recognize this person is a uh, knows the uh, the details, they don't need to go through the uh, you know the, the formal process. Like for example, there are many many gdoleado that people don't realize they didn't go, they didn't get a smicha in in a traditional way like people get it. Like for example, Rabbi Vadya and uh, and some of the other chachamim didn't go and get tested uh, to get their dayanut even uh, because they were what's called the gaon mukal. They were a known genius. So it would be, uh, you know, uh, number one, a huge benefit for the community to have them as Dayanim. And number two, there, there was no question of whether they knew the material. Some of them knew the material better than the Dayanim that were there. Uh, but, you know, as far as to uh, uh, some of the Chachamim in the previous generation, uh, you know, got it, uh, you know, from their rabbi after a specific time or after a specific test and, and different things. But nonetheless, it's not something that you get overnight. It's certainly not something you get overnight. It depends who, what, when, and how. When I did, um, when I got my uh, yore yore, uh, it's uh, the at the at the event. I remember there was I don't know maybe uh, I think there were maybe 40, 50 people that got smicha that day, and it was only me and one other guy. Or maybe two other guys that got a yore yore. The rest of the guys got, uh, uh, you know, a lower level smicha. Uh, again, uh, are you going to use all of it? Depends, depends. Many times people get smicha just for, uh, uh, you know, uh, not, not because they're going to use it. And many times uh, the smicha is not going to do them any, any good. Uh, many times it's better off they didn't have it. You know, it depends. Depends how, what you're using it for. You know, there are many people that have smicha that in reality don't know anything. There are many, they know how to pass a test or they know somebody that gave them some certificate or whatever it is. And there are some people that know a lot and they don't have a smicha. Uh, and so there's not, the, the, the smicha doesn't necessarily have value by default. It all depends on the person that, uh, you know, that is going to use it, if you will. Um, you know, there's certainly a, uh, you know, enough people out there that uh, we know that, uh, you know, whether they have a smicha or they don't have a smicha, we want to be part of their life and, and the opposite. You know, people that have or don't have a smicha and we want nothing to do with them. You know, so smicha by default doesn't necessarily uh, mean uh, righteousness. It usually represents a certain amount of knowledge, but not always. Not always, because again, somebody could uh, uh, have a smicha, but not necessarily for... Uh, uh, you know, for, for what people think. Uh, when and what are we allowed to be proud of according to the Torah? 
uh, be proud of. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, if it's if it's spiritual uh, 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 achievements that you have for yourself, that you have a certain goal for yourself, that you're going to study a certain amount per day, or you're going to have gain a certain amount of knowledge, then certainly this is something you should be happy about and proud of for your own reasons, not to, you know, flaunt it and tell people you're better than them or anything, but proud for yourself. You, you need to have goals, you need to have aspirations. It's very healthy to have that uh, in order to succeed in anything needless to say in Torah. So uh, definitely say if a person does reach their goals in, in, in spirituality, passing a test, uh, especially immorality, a person should definitely be proud of themselves uh, for doing so. But again, proud internally and, and for the right reasons uh, of something that's meaningful. Uh, if you helped somebody in a, in a very uh, you know uh, righteous way, very good way, uh, it's also something good. If you overcame your evil inclination, uh, you wanted to be angry, but you contained yourself. You uh, wanted to be stingy, but you uh, overcame it and you became generous and so on. So each time a person overcomes uh, different obstacles, certainly they have something to be proud of. But again, it's uh, it's important for a person to know how to control themselves, even their their positive pride, because it's very quickly uh, that positive pride can turn into a negative one, where a person can think that they're more righteous than everybody else uh, because they did a few good things. Uh, somebody asked Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, Allah Shalom. Uh, if it's okay that he uh, starts wearing tefillin all day because he's in the uh, yeshiva all day and he's learning and he wanted to put on tefillin all day because he read in the books that uh, it's a very big ma'ala, it's very great to keep tefillin on and to study Torah with tefillin on. So he said, why don't I just leave it on all day? I'm I'm at the uh, synagogue all day. Let me just have it all day. And uh, to his surprise and dismay, uh, Rav Meir Eliyahu told uh, Rav uh, Mordechai Eliyahu, uh, told him, No, you're not allowed. He says, Why not? But the, the Chachamim say great things about it. He says, Yes, but I also know you and I know my students and I know what I'm saying. The answer is no, because if even there was one time that you are looking at another pe- person in the yeshiva, in the kolel, and for even one time that you think that you're better than them, or they're less than you, it's not worth it for you to have it, that feeling on, uh, you know, uh, ever. Meaning that you're trying to achieve righteousness, it's much better for you to achieve, uh, to, to, to not view kosher people as wicked uh, because you think that you're uh, more righteous than them. Uh, it's much more important to do that than to uh, do this extra level of righteousness. Because that extra level of righteousness is going to lead you to one single wickedness. Whereas if you stayed the way you are, uh, then uh, it's less likely to happen. Now, of course, everybody has their, is at their own levels, and, and, and surely they have to ask their rabbis. And Shlomo Melech says, Don't be overly righteous, meaning that a person needs to know where they stand. Some people can handle it. Some people can't. Some people worry about the wrong thing. Some people worry about the right thing. There are certain people that... You know, they uh, say, listen, I'm making the extra mitzvah of keeping on my tefillin for an extra half hour, hour after prayers. Now, that may sound like a good thing, unless you see some of these people that have their tefillin on and they're having a phone call, they're eating, they're talking to people about things that are not relevant to the Torah, they're socializing. A person like that, it was better off he didn't put on tefillin, uh, you know, at all than, than to do all of what he's doing sometimes. So again, it's a person needs to know that it's better doesn't always mean better uh, for everybody, uh, and more doesn't necessarily always mean more for everybody. Every per, every case has to be reviewed, uh, you know, specifically. But uh, again, if a person has overcome a uh, certain big test, especially when it comes to character trait development, that is certainly something that they should be proud of. If a person studied and completed a uh, a certain amount of uh, Torah that is more than what he's used to, then he needs to be, you know, happy with himself. I don't know if I would necessarily call it pride, but or proud of himself. But nonetheless, he should certainly be happy with himself. But make sure that that happiness or that uh, pride that a person has is motivating him to do more 
rather than debilitating him to think that to the point where he thinks he's doing enough. So the way you know that whether pride is healthy or, or not is if it is motivating you to do more good, then you know it's 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 healthy. Uh, if it's uh, debilitating you, where it's simply telling you that you're doing good enough, then it's not a healthy pride, because uh, that type of pride comes from arrogance. Uh, I wish I was the person I would have listened. Uh, these uh, are my issues. I wish it was that person. I wish it was. Oh, okay. All of us have made mistakes in our life. Where we were is not necessarily uh, important. It's important what we're doing today in order to make sure that tomorrow is better. Um, if someone has a Jewish mother by birth who marries a Christian man and then was raised Christian, how will he or she be judged in heaven after they die? What were their uh, expectations? A person that was born to a Jewish woman is 100% a Jew, according to Allah. Uh, even if their father is Christian, even if their father is Muslim, even if their father is a uh, UFO. If, he is, if his mother is a Jew, then he is a Jew. Now, as far as if that person lived an entire life without ever knowing that they are Jewish because they thought that they were Christian their whole life, uh, then of course this is a uh, their test accordingly. But uh, it's hard for me to believe that uh, you know a person would live their entire life without knowing the truth. Because remember, if they're a Jew, that means that Hashem put them in this world in order to be a Jew, in order to live a, a certain life, in order to achieve a certain purpose, and not just to live a uh, uh, a purposeless life. So surely Hashem has shown Himself to that person in different ways in order to show them their Judaism and, you know, and, and help them make their choices. Whether they make the right choice or not is up to them. But Hashem is not uh, you know, building us to fail. He's not putting us in a situation where it's impossible for us to succeed. That's the first thing. Uh, so surely all of us will get multiple and in many cases countless uh, um, opportunities to see the truth and we have to make the choices accordingly. Uh, but a Jew is expected to fulfill the entire Torah. The second that that Jew knows that he's Jewish and knows that Judaism involves, uh, you know, they know what Shabbat is, they know what, uh, uh, you know, tefillin are, you know, the very basics of what things are. They don't need to know all the details, but they know what a Jew is, that a Jew goes to synagogue, they're no longer a captured baby, they are uh, a Jew that uh, has free choice. And if they choose uh, wisely, they'll succeed. But uh, to think that just because they had a bad past or they had a, uh, a, a difficult uh, upbringing, that's going to relieve them from, uh, from responsibility? No. I have a guy that, um, when we met him, he was a young kid, young kid, he's a teenager. Uh, he was going to a, uh, a Christian school, a Christian school, uh, and uh, his mom was Jewish. And his father is uh, not only a uh, Christian, but he's an anti-Semitic Christian. He hates Jews. His father hates Jews with a passion. Because he was brought up in, you know, communist mentality, but uh, at the same token, later on, he abandoned the communism to a certain extent and adopted idolatry instead. And long story short, when I first talked to his father, the conversation went like uh, this. He cursed me out for about three to four minutes straight. And then uh, I tried saying about one or two things, and then he hung up on my face. That was the first conversation we had. Uh, the point of the conversation was to convince the father to allow me to take his son, that's Jewish, out of the Christian school. Uh, so I got some cursings for that. Baruch Hashem. Anyway, uh, this young boy uh, was very committed, learned a lot of our shuim, learned a lot in books, you know, tried to do whatever he can, pray to Hashem. And through literally a series of miracles and uh, endless amount of effort from, uh, from our team, especially our Rabbi Leib, uh, the, this kid has not only uh, got out of this Christian school, but today is uh, Mamash on his way to becoming a very, very serious Torah scholar. He learns in yeshiva. He's a very big matmid, nonstop learning. He's you know very, very special person. And, uh, but if you, you know, backwards, ask the same kid 
three, four, five, six years ago, or just simply look at uh, the, the statistics of such a thing happening, the chances would be zero. Chances literally were zero. And Baruch Hashem, today this kid is on his way to becoming a serious Tomit Chacham. He's learning in serious yeshiva, not like a yeshiva for, uh, for people that are, uh, you know, just came out of the jungle. You talk about yeshiva, yeshiva, serious yeshiva, serious learning, and Baruch Hashem, he's doing good. So, uh, but uh, again, it's, he had a uh, tough start. Tough start, not just Christian parents, anti-Semitic. Literally anti-Semitic. I'm not talking about, I'm not joking about it. Like when, he, when, he, when I spoke to his father for, you know, the first or second time, he made fun of the Holocaust. Made fun of the Holocaust, you know, how the Jews are, were losers. They just let the Nazis kill them. And, you know, nasty, nasty things. But, Baruch Hashem, we keep going. We fight for every Neshama wherever we possibly can. And, Baruch Hashem, the kid is in the yeshiva today. Uh, who knows? Maybe the father will convert one day. I don't know. But at least we're able to save whatever we can save. So the key is to understand is that that didn't happen because of me or that happened because of a series of, of, of combined efforts. Okay. If, 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 but if it wasn't for that kid wanting it, praying about it, yearning for it, nothing would happen. If it wasn't for the different people that play different roles in the story, wanting it, praying for it, doing whatever it takes, it wouldn't happen. You know, it's, 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 I, a lot of times people ask me about, you know, my tshuva story and, and, and how, you know, uh, uh, Rabbi Ephraim uh, saved me from, from the genome that I was on. And every time I tell this to Rabbi Ephraim, how he's amazing, how he saved my life, I was destined to genome, now I have at least a chance of going to heaven and all that stuff. He la- you know, just, he's like, you're saying ridiculous things. Like, he laughs at me. What you, I'm like, why? You saved. No, you didn't do it. He goes, no, you didn't do anything. Like, what do you mean you didn't do anything? If it wasn't for you, it wasn't this. He said, I didn't do anything. You wanted it. You were willing to listen. I was willing to teach. What's the meaning that what he's obviously is he's, he's humble. But the point I'm trying to make is that without a person willing to help themselves, no one in the world can help them. That's what Rabbeinu Yonah writes in Sharet Tshuva about 800 years ago. If a person is not going to help themselves, all of the Musar in the world is not going to help them. So, the key is to understand that every person that's in this world is a creation of God. If he is a Jew, that means he's not only a creation of God, he's the son of God. She's the daughter of God. They're, 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 they're chosen, they're special, they're unique, which means there is extra care, extra consideration for that person. So surely Hashem is not going to put is the, the ones that he cares the most about, the ones that he uh, has chosen, in a lose-lose battle. He surely is going to give them a lot of opportunities to come back home because that's ultimately their purpose. That's their purpose. The purpose of everybody in this world is to serve Hashem, to, 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 to do His will because it is for their interest that they do His will. That's how they end up going to heaven. But, uh, you know, so Hashem is going to give a lot of person a lot of chances. But even if the greatest teacher in the world lives next door, even if the greatest teacher in the world is their parent, even if the greatest, uh, you know, uh, most generous person in the world is their family member, and even if the most righteous person on planet Earth is uh, their uh, best friend, if that person doesn't want to help themselves, nothing in the world can change that. Nothing in the world can There has to be some uh, self-motivation. And that really applies in anything in life. So... Uh, Hashem is going to open the doors for each and every soul on planet earth to go back home to do tshuva he's going to open up the door multiple times throughout everybody's life whether a person chooses to enter or not that's going to be up to them and that's what they're going to be judged for uh they're going to be judged for you know whether they entered or not whether they followed God or not a tinoksha who dies if they will be judged as a gentile with seven laws of Noah, then they will go to heaven of Gentiles. No, nobody dies and changes religion. There's no such thing. A Jew is a Jew, even if he's a sinner, even if he's a sinner, even if he's a wicked person, he never turns into a Noahide, even if he converts to Christianity, even if he doesn't keep anything, if he dies, even if he knows nothing, if he dies, he's judged as a Jew. He's never judged as a Noahide. 
he's not judged as a Gentile, he's judged as a Jew. And uh, there is no such thing as a wicked person entering heaven. No such thing. It's a, uh, and also, if, uh, if a Jew is not observing the Torah, then certainly he's not observing the seven Noahide laws either. Uh, because the, uh, the, the seven Noahide laws are uh, logical, and a Jew that's not observing the Torah is uh, typically uh, doing everything against logic. And it's, uh, so either way, it wouldn't work, but still, nobody changes uh, from Jew to Noahide just because they didn't know anything. How important is to respect a rabbi? And what are the implications of not giving as much respect should be given to a rabbi? Uh, well, I, I asked, uh, I have a whole, sh- two shiurim about it last week. Uh, so I'll save you guys the time and myself the energy to going over it again. Uh, there's two lectures about it. I spoke about it in Stump the Rabbi last week, and I think I spoke about it in something else. One of the other lectures about the rabbi and the student of the rabbi, you can watch those lectures. It goes to an extensive list of sources of the importance of respecting rabbis. Uh, but uh, the key is to know that uh, the sages teach us the amount of fear you're supposed to have, awe you're supposed to have of your rabbi is no less than you're supposed to have for God himself. So if that gives you an understanding, uh, then that's something you can build on. Most people are not even willing to be afraid of their parents, needless to say their rabbi or anybody else. So, But uh, for a person to really be uh, righteous, they have to have uh, fear of the rabbi and uh, honor of the rabbi uh, that's uh, very, very extensive. And it was worth it to uh, go over those uh, lectures that I did because it goes through the halachot. It goes through the Rambam's halachot of the, uh, uh, what a person is supposed to do with their rabbi, how they're supposed to feel, how they're supposed to behave, sit, stand, uh, and so on and so forth. Do I offer a Torah study online? Yes, this is it. If you meant, uh, do I offer one-on-one uh, where people could, uh, uh, you know, uh, ask me questions and things like that online. No, I don't do that. I don't have that kind of time. Um, when is what is a good source about Jethro's converting? I'm not really sure what that means. What's a good source about Jethro converting? Uh, but if you look at uh, the the Parashat uh, Itro, uh, and you look at the commentary by Rashi, by the Ramban, uh, both of them discuss. Uh, the different times, the debate in regards to when uh, Jethro, uh, uh, whether he stayed or he left, but needless to say, everybody knows that Jethro converted to Judaism uh, because it's also mentioned later on in the Tanakh uh, that uh, Jethro came back with uh, all of the uh, people that he brought with him from Midian that he converted uh, and he was gifted. uh, The um, This is after Moses' death. So he outlived Moses by many years, and he uh, was uh, gifted uh, uh, initially the city of Yitro, the city, the city of Jethro. Uh, and, uh, but then he uh, didn't want to go there because it's like a you know, resort. He wanted to go learn Torah, so they told him that he has to go to Midbar Yehuda uh, because that's where he could learn Torah. And he went there with all of his uh, family, and Chachamim say that uh, in Gemara that they... Uh, they got to. Uh, they knew nothing when they came there. They were relatively igno- ignorant because you know they didn't uh, learn Torah for forty years with the rest of Am Yisrael. But uh, they studied in Midbar Yehuda and got to Ruach Hakodesh. They got to uh, Ruach Hakodesh. So they were very holy people. Michael, it seems to be getting hotter every year. Is that part of the end of times? And how should a Jew handle extreme heat when in a sukkah? Uh, is it getting hotter every year? Uh, yeah, it probably is getting hotter every year. Uh, is that part of the end of times? I mean, I know that the uh, Gemara says that before uh, Mashiach comes, uh, or once Mashiach comes, uh, uh, Hashem is going to take out the sun out of its shell. This is actually from a source of David Melech in Teilim. Uh, that's how he's going to punish the wicked people by burning them with the, uh, with the sun, and the righteous people will be healed by the sun. Uh, but as far as it getting hotter before Mashiach comes, I don't remember seeing a source that says it's actually going to get hotter before Mashiach comes, but it's possible. A lot of things are going to change. Nature is going to change. There's going to be earthquakes. It's going to be all types of things, but I wouldn't worry so much about climate change and, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, that's, there's, uh, a lot of false news in that world. Uh, in regards to how does a person deal with, uh, Hatsuka, 
Uh, this is a battle that I've been fighting for many years of trying to fight the heat uh, of Florida's Genom every year during the uh, during Sukkot and uh, uh, you know we're getting better at it every year we but it's a very uh, it's not a perfect solution yet you know you uh, the, the solution is have a bunch of air conditioners uh, connected to your sukkah uh, depending on the size of the sukkah, but uh, this is the time that uh, you need preparation ahead of time, and you need to also uh, not worry about money, because uh, whether it's the electric bill or it's the air conditioners themselves, the way to make the sukkah comfortable in the way that uh, you know we're, we we are used to living in society today requires an air conditioner. Uh, in other parts of the world and other types of lives and climates, not everybody has that, but uh, I know that uh, for us, if we don't have an air conditioner in a sukkah, it's unbearable. And even when we do have a, uh, an air conditioner in a sukkah, if it's not connected right, or if the tube is not sticking out, all types of other things that go along with it, it's, uh, it's, it's very hard to be in a sukkah. Uh, it's very hard. So a person needs to do everything they possibly can to build a sukkah in such a fashion that they want to live there. They want to live there because that's really what it's supposed to be. The sukkah is supposed to be a place that is a replacement for your house. If you would have do, you would do it for your house that you live in the rest of the year, you should be able to do it for your sukkah. And there are very serious people that literally move their entire living room into their sukkah. They have real furniture, real bedroom. I've even seen real sinks and, and, and a lot of refrigerators. And some serious people are very, you know, they do amazing things with their sukkah. I, Bo Hashem, try to do as much as I can each year. And each year we do a little bit more than the year before. It's one of my favorite mitzvot. Uh, but every year I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting myself because I'm disappointed I forgot something or something that I did didn't work. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm already thinking about it now. So, yeah, that's, uh, last year we had, I think, uh, four air conditioners in the sukkah. And I still wasn't like a hundred percent content because the uh, the uh, you know it wasn't it wasn't like uh, I wanted to. It was but the best year ever, Baruch Hashem. But I can, this year we're gonna do better. Bezalat Hashem. All right. Thank you very much for learning with me. Uh, we will have Bezalat Hashem a Hebrew shiur later tonight. Uh, so for those of you that speak Hebrew, stay tuned. Uh, we'll have a Hebrew shiur posted. Uh, I don't know. I guess several hours from now. Uh, but it'll be on our channels and Hebrew channel and so on. Uh, those of you that want to uh, buy the uh, raffle ticket, uh, your uh, you know to get potential uh, the USBs and also the ticket and so on, you're running out of time because uh, you know once uh, you know once it's done, it's done. Uh, the event is next week. Uh, the event is next week, so try to do whatever you can. Either way. Uh, there's a uh, uh, last bonus that I, uh, you know, wanted to uh, say. Anybody that watched the shiur up to this point and wants to get some free USBs uh, mailed to them, then just send me a text message and uh, say, Stump the Rabbi USB and send me your address and I'll send you some USBs to give out in your community uh, for free uh, so you'll be saving a fortune of money but also be able to help people do tshuva you send me a text message uh, saying uh, stump the rabbi uh, USB and uh, I'll send you the USBs alright Amen